Good morning, and welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We've passed the weekend now, and I had a day off yesterday for some business that I had to tend to, and uh, there's been uh, some days lapse, so we'll recount a little bit where we are. We're currently reading the book Rome and Civil Liberty by... James Aiken Wiley, J.A. Wiley, as he's more commonly known, the great Protestant historian, James A. Wiley, is telling us about the history of Britain and Rome's attempt after the Protestant Reformation and also the French Revolution, that one-two punch that nearly destroyed the papacy. When the papacy received its mortal wound, Rome set about to reconquer that which was lost at the Protestant Reformation and the French Revolution. Now, we've concluded uh, the previous chapter, which was a sarcastic uh, dissertation about the supposed uh, freedoms that would remain in Great Britain, the civil liberties would remain in Great Britain, even though Roman Catholicism uh, was coming into the country. Now, it's it's an absurd assumption, an absurd assertion. James A. Wiley well knew it because he well knew the history of the Roman Catholic Church. If you give Rome any quarter at all, she will eventually take over your country and pass her laws, that is Roman Catholic canon law, and under Roman Catholic canon law there is no Protestant liberty. So James A. Wiley is warning England if you court Rome, if you give Rome any quarter, you will eventually become her slave. And just as England was enslaved by the papacy and tyrannized by the papacy before the Protestant Reformation, here at the time of the, of the writing of this book, Rome is again, or er, Britain, Protestant Great Britain, is once again under the threat of Romanization. That power of Antichrist seated in Rome, the man of sin attempting to reconquer that which what had fallen into Christ's dominion, Great Britain, at the time of the Protestant Reformation. Now, beginning at the top of page 27, entitled The Papal Aggression, The Reconnoiter or the First Steps of Rome to Reconquer England are recounted here. He says the shock of the French Revolution convinced the Church of Rome that in the slumber in which she had passed the 18th century, she had rested her mitered head upon hidden fires and that she must arouse herself and strike for her old dominion or be swept out of existence. So this is a testament in James A. Wiley's eloquent eloquent words that after suffering the losses of the Protestant Reformation, and also of the French Revolution, Rome finally woke up and realized that if she was ever going to exist, she had to go on the offensive. She was nearly swept out of existence. Okay, this is a this is the 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 mortal wound that the Scripture speaks of, and it was a very real situation. If Rome could not undo the damage that was suffered at the Protestant Reformation and the French Revolution, she would cease to exist. Now he says, accordingly, as soon as peace had returned to Europe, that is, after the French Revolution, the Jesuits came forth from their hiding places and concocted that plan for reducing Britain under the yoke of Rome, which we have ever since been pursuing Uh, which they, that is the Jesuits, have ever since been pursuing with great astuteness and most astonishing success. So who led the charge to reconquer 
Great Britain. Protestant Great Britain. It was the Jesuits. The Jesuits who are essentially the the elect of the Roman Catholic Church. They are the special forces. They are the legion of warrior priests who swear a bloody oath to destroy Protestantism from off the face of the earth and then to elevate their papacy to global supremacy, global governing power. That's their purpose, or they cease to be Jesuits. And after the Protestant Reformation and the French Revolution, the Jesuits immediately went to work and they focused their attention on Protestant Great Britain. And why Protestant Great Britain? Because Protestantism had completely taken over the government. Rome was no longer in power. The Vatican, the papacy, had no control in England. Parliament was isolated from Romanism. No Roman Catholics could uh, uh, serve in Parliament, and no Roman Catholic could sit on the, on the throne of England. Uh, uh, the kings and queens of England were bound by a Protestant oath. And so uh, Protestantism became essentially the state-sponsored religion. Now, the Jesuits understood as wealthy and powerful as Great Britain had become as a result of the Protestant Reformation. She had a great deal of influence on the rest of Europe. And if Great Britain could be won back under the authority of the papacy, then Europe would follow eventually. So the Jesuits concocted a strategy to Catholicize Protestant Great Britain. And you must understand that uh, if the Jesuits would go to this much trouble, as we will enumerate as we continue in our reading here, we must comprehend that the Jesuits would be just as much interested in Catholicizing Protestant America as they were Protestant Great Britain. So keep this in mind. These are examples. This is vital history for our understanding of how the Jesuits have control of the government of our country and why our laws and liberty, our laws embrace Roman Catholic canon law and our Protestant liberties are being destroyed. The purpose, once again, of reading this book is so we can understand British history to help us understand American history. <clears throat> history in this country is literally repeating itself, and the vast majority of Americans, common everyday Americans, have no clue about it. And uh, we can carefully examine this history and come to some very firm conclusions about our own country, and then what must be done about it. All right, what must be done about it. Now, it says, accordingly, as soon as peace had returned to Europe, the Jesuits came forth from their hiding places and concocted that plan for reducing Britain back under the yoke of Rome, which they have ever since been pursuing with great astuteness and most astonishing success. That plan may be, uh, may be gathered from the various hints dropped by Dr. Wiseman in his book on the four last popes, and in particular from his conversations there recorded with Pope Gregory the Sixteenth and the Abbey Lamine. All right. This is a book that was published at that time. Dr. Wiseman was a member of uh, the Church of England, and uh, he began to take a sympathetic, uh, uh, a sympathetic stand toward the Vatican, toward the popes. And so he wrote a book entitled Four Last Popes. It's still extant. Matter of fact, you can read it uh, on uh, archives.org. Just Google the title, and you can go and read that book for yourself. <clears throat> now he say, he calls it a great work was to be done. The first step was to prepare the proper instruments for doing for the doing of it. Okay, to make England, to return England uh, as uh, to a, a possession of the popes. There had to be a plan, and there had to be an organization that was capable of doing it. And that organization was the Jesuits, 
and the first steps in that in that direction were were going to have to be put in place now he says with this view the english college at rome was restored so the very first thing they did was they reopened an english speaking college at the vatican to train englishmen a college which had been closed when protestantism became the official religion of great britain it had no more use for rome rome was not allowed in the country neither were her jesuits now when they decided after the french revolution to reconquer great britain the first thing the jesuits did was open an English-speaking college in Rome to educate Englishmen. Now he says this was the deed of Pope Pius VII and his well-known minister, Cardinal Consalvi. This college had been closed for a period of a generation. On the 18th of December of 1888, a small band of youths entered that college and took possession of its long deserted corridors and chambers. Who were these young youths, and from what country had they come? They had come from Great Britain. They had been selected with great care and sent to Rome to be educated under the keen eye and the skillful hand of the Jesuits, that when their education was finished, they might come back to England and begin their work of reconquering Britain to the Roman faith. Okay, I want you to remember what we've just read. Rome made the decision to conquer Protestant Great Britain. Not to leave Protestant Great Britain alone. Not to take her Catholicism wherever it was received. But to reconquer the Protestants. That's the very mission of the Jesuits. And that's why the Jesuits led this mission. And the first thing they did was begin to train and educate with a Jesuit education protestant english children they opened a prestigious college and the high-ranking children of britain were sent there to be educated but they became enemies of protestantism in the process that's what jesuitism teaches jesuitism teaches that there is only one on the earth that is fit to rule mankind, and that is the papacy, as the vicar and the replacement of Christ on the earth. Protestantism is a grievous heresy that must be routed off the face of the earth one way or another. By fair means or foul, Protestantism has to be destroyed. So Great Britain sent their children to this school. They came back Jesuitized, why we make all reference to those who have, who have and obtain Jesuit education. They are first to be suspected. They are to be carefully watched for uh, me, uh, methods and means to destroy Protestantism wherever they go. <clears throat> they were educated under the keen eye and the skillful hand of the Jesuits that when their education was finished, they might come back to England and begin their work of reconquering Protestant Great Britain to the Roman Catholic faith. Of this number was the future Cardinal Wiseman. Okay, one of the children eventually became a Roman Catholic Cardinal. He says one can scarce ref uh, refrain a smile when he contrasts this little army of six with the greatness of their allotted task. Okay, the first group of British children to be educated in this Jesuit college in Rome, this English-speaking Jesuit education, were six British children. Just six. And it says, but Rome can foresee great results from apparently insignificant causes, okay? Just like a cancer, it begins to grow with one cell and eventually amasses the entire body. And it says, from Rome, the scene now shifts 
to Britain. These Jews were, were in due time educated and sent back to England. The implements fashioned abroad were now employed in fashioning other implements at Rome. So these six children were sent back to Great Britain to recruit help. Okay, and it's going to grow and grow and grow. And it says the first object was to reduce the Catholic laity and priesthood of Ireland thoroughly under Jesuit control. So they took their efforts to Ireland. They skipped Protestant Great Britain, or Protestant England, and they focused their attention on ancient Roman Catholic Ireland. First, we had these six children, educated by the Jesuits, have to have some, some Roman Catholic help. And they picked Ireland because it was predominantly Roman Catholic and that the Roman Catholics of Ireland would most aptly obey these Jesuit-trained students. Okay. First, they have to conquer Ireland, then Protestant England. And they attempted first was to reduce the Catholic laity and the priesthood of Ireland thoroughly under Jesuit control. So they had to bring all the Roman Catholic priests and all the Roman Catholic laity of Ireland back under Jesuit control. <clears throat> now with this view, the College of Clongos was erected, filled with Jesuit professors and open for the youth of the middle and upper classes of Ireland. So the, the first thing they did was open a, a university and seated only Jesuits as its teachers in, in Ireland, the College of Clongos. And it was open for youth of, of the Irish children, and it says the next step was to reduce the priests of Ireland under Jesuit influence. Dr. Kenry was sent from Rome and appointed principal of Maynooth. Its chairs were filled with Jesuits from the College of Clongos, and thus was the priesthood of Ireland brought completely under Jesuit control. The priests were under Dr. Kenry, the, high, the head of British Jesuitism, and Dr. Kenry was under General Ru Ruthann, the head of the, of the Jesuitism of the world. General Ruthann was the Jesuit general at the time. And Dr. Kenry was, Dr., uh, was General Ruthann's right-hand man uh, in Ireland. And it says, Now, headed up by a man of no principle but a good deal of rough eloquence, Mr. O'Connell, the political agitation was commenced, which resulted in the great Romanist victory of 1829. By the Act of 29, the doors of British legislature were opened to the subjects of another potentate, that is the Pope, and a right was conceded to the members of a foreign community to legislate for a state whose law is not their law, and whose sovereign is not their sovereign. In other words, the Act of 29 gave Roman Catholics, restored to Roman Catholics, the right to occupy seats in the British Parliament, the British legislature. And that was the beginning of the fall of Protestant Great Britain. Do we have Roman Catholics, Papists, Jesuit trained people in our parliament? In our parliament, in our uh, Congress, absolutely the most powerful politicians in our country in all three branches of government are Jesuit trained. And they have been almost since the founding of this country. England recognized the threat that the Jesuits posed. They fought back. The United States has never lifted a finger against these Jesuits. And you must ask yourself, what effect have they had on the civil laws of our land? What effect do they now have on the civil laws of our land? 
It says, by the act of 19, or by 1829, the doors of the British legislature were opened to the subjects of another pontiff, another potentate, rather. In other words, they were not subjects of the, Brit, of the, of the Protestant Queen of England. They were subjects of the Pope. They were foreigners, spiritual and temporal foreigners. And here, in violation of British law, they're now being allowed to be legislators, to pass laws in the country. It says, and a right was conceded to the members of a foreign community, that is the Roman Catholic community, to legislate for a state whose laws is not their laws, in other words, the civil laws of Protestant Great Britain were Protestant in their character, and they, they were the laws of the land. And these Roman Catholics saw those laws as contrary to Roman Catholic canon law, and so they sought position in Parliament to change those Protestant laws to make them conform to Roman Catholic canon law. They were first loyal to Rome and to the potentate in Rome, the papacy, the man of sin, and they were subjects in name only to the Queen of England. So you can see from the very beginning they have irreconcilable differences with the, with the Protestant government of England and the Protestant crown. They're all Jesuit trained, they all understand that there's no authority on earth higher than the Pope, and that he has the right to reconquer England and to make, make England Roman Catholic, and they've already achieved their objective by making it lawful for the first time in over a generation that Roman Catholics can sit in the, pro, in the Parliament of Great Britain. They will not be subject to, to uh, the civil laws of the Protestant government, but their intention is to overthrow those laws and to make them conform to Roman Catholic canon law and then to impose them on all the people of England and Ireland and Scotland. This is how a country is made Roman Catholic. This is how it always happens. Outside of a, of a physical confrontation and an all-out war to conquer Protestantism, this is how a country is Catholicized, little at a time. And the Act of 1829 got the ball really rolling for Rome. Now, again, he says, by the Act of 29, the doors of British legislature were opened to the subjects of another potentate, in other words, Roman Catholics, and a right was conceded to the members of a foreign community Roman Catholicism, their first citizens of Rome, to legislate for a state whose law is not their law, Protestant law is not Roman Catholic canon law, and whose sovereign, the Queen of England, is not their sovereign. This done, the next step was to bring the lay adherents of their church in England under Jesuit control. All right? They were going to Catholicize the laity of the Church of England, a Protestant church. They were going to bring them under Jesuit control. See how they step by step first got privileges in Parliament. Now they're going to interfere with the adherence to the Church of England, the pew sitters of the Church of England. They're going to Jesuitize the laity of the Protestant Church. Is that happening in our country today? Absolutely, and I talk about it here on Inquisition all, uh, Update all the time to the point I'm, I'm accused of being repetitious. <laughs> but repetition is necessary, and the Jesuit school of thought that was taught to the laity of the Protestant churches in this country is called futurism. And it's the same strategy that the Jesuits used in England. And we'll come, we'll come back from the break and we'll elaborate further. We'll continue our reading and discussion of Rome and Civil Liberty by James A. Wiley. 
You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. We'll be right back after the message. Okay, welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support the program, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors it. And if you would like to talk to me directly, please do so by email. My email address is tom at seawaves.us. And I appreciate hearing from my listeners and very encouraged by some of the emails that I've been getting lately. This is starting to sink in even though some people accuse me of being repetitious. It needs to be repeated. The truth never grows old, and we'll continue to pursue it here at Inquisition Update for as long as God gives us breath. Now, I noticed during the break I made just a little bit of a mistake, and I got ahead of myself here. I said that uh, the the Jesuits set up shop in the Church of England to Jesuitize English Protestants, and uh, that is a result of a misreading here, just a slight misreading. He says, this done, the next step was to bring the lay adherents of their church, the Roman Catholic Church in England, not the adherents of the Church of England, but their church in England, that is the Roman Catholic Church in England, under Jesuit control. So they began to Jesuitize the 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 Roman Catholic laity in England. And this is consistent with what they did in Ireland. So they simply moved their mission to Protestant England. And he said the College of Stonyhurst was erected and filled with Jesuit professors, Roman Catholic Stonyhurst. And into that college was gathered the youth of the old Catholic families in England to receive an education and polish and polish fitting them to take their place with effect in English society. So the Jesuits are going to educate and Jesuitize, that is to breed anti Protestant sentiment in the into the Roman Catholic laity, the children of the Roman Catholic laity, the old Roman Catholic families of England. Now he says, thus was the whole Catholic body, lay and cleric, in Great Britain and Ireland, subjugated and made ready to be wielded by the Jesuits. Okay? They became the sword in the hand of the Jesuit order. There's big trouble brewing for Protestant Great Britain. James A. Wiley recognized it and warned about it because the, the warning needed to be sounded. If England was going to remain Protestant, if England was going to remain free, it had to be first educated about what the mission of the Jesuits were in that country and then to seek means to stop it. Had none of these warnings been given, had no effort been made to stop it, England England would be Roman Catholic today. And I believe for the most part James A. Wiley's warnings were not heeded, and England is Catholic today. And that's why America is Catholic also. Now, he says, having taken proper measures with her own members in Great Britain, Rome next turned her attention to the Protestants. Okay, here's where I got ahead of myself. Now they're going to work on the Protestants. They're the, the Jesuits are fully armed with Roman Catholics, powerful Roman Catholics in Ireland and England. They now have seats of representation in Parliament, and the priests of Rome have been Jesuitized in England and Ireland, and now they are a formidable foe, a formidable foe for Protestantism, and now they're going after the Protestants says her first measure was to seize upon the universities. So the Jesuits infiltrated the Protestant universities of England. That's what's happened in the United States today. And it says, on the idea that a plan had been formed for perverting Britain, where should we expect that plan first to discover itself? Why, where but at Oxford and Cambridge, the two most prestigious 
Protestant universities in Great Britain were captured by the Jesuits stealthily. Okay? These are the twin fountains of influence in England, Oxford and Cambridge. From there, from Oxford and Cambridge, do the pulpit and the bar of England draw their supplies. In other words, the priests and the lawyers. Those who occupied Parliament, the lawyers of England, were drawn from Oxford and Cambridge. They were Protestant in their faith, Protestant in their, in their beliefs. And that's why the laws of England passed by Protestant Parliament were Protestant and, and, and upheld the people's liberties. Even Roman Catholics benefited from their Protestant legislature legislators in Parliament. All right. The pulpits of the churches of England got their pastors from Oxford and Cambridge, and so did the bar of England. The, the system of law got their adherents, their attorneys, their judges, from Oxford and Cambridge. So we have Protestant law being uh, uh, legislated in Parliament. We have Protestant law being defended in the courts by Protestant attorneys and Protestant judges. And that's just a recipe for liberty and justice. Liberty for everyone. Not just Protestants, but Catholics as well. Now, from thence do the pulpit and the bar of England draw their supplies. There it is that our future legislators, our cabin, cabinet ministers, and privy counselors are educated. Romanizing teachers were placed in certain of the chairs of these seats of learning, and thus were the seeds of popery deposited in many a young and unsuspecting mind. So the Jesuits got their tools to occupy positions of authority in the Protestant uh, in the Protestant universities. That's what they did in this country. Now he says, about the year 33, the next step was taken. The tracts of the times began to be issued. Everybody's heard about the tract societies of England. He says, in this, Rome showed that great practical sagacity and quick discernment in which she so much excels. She did not sit down and write a ponderous volume. She knew that few would buy and still fewer would read such an exposition. Oxford produced by the thousand four-page tracts, and into each tract she put the, the, the substance of a volume and Rome turned them to good account. Okay, we've heard of the Tractarian Society. Rome, through these Protestant schools, began to produce Roman propaganda in very readable and very explicit Christian tracts. And society gobbled them up, and thus thereby they were educated with Ro the seeds of Romanism. Now he says some philosophers have held that matter uh, have held that matter is so compressible that the whole universe might be put into a nutshell. Okay, this is the early philosophical uh, beginnings of the Big Bang. Okay, he says some philosophers have held that matter is so compressible that the whole universe might be put into a nutshell. However, this may be the whole papal system was so compressed as to be put into these nutshells, these little tracts, which were showered like snowflakes over the country. So he likens the, the, these gospel, or these, these Christian tracts to be powerhouses of Roman Catholic propaganda. Very, very powerful concise tracts that could be read by the multitudes and would hold Roman Catholic theology within them. The seeds of overthrow of the, of the Protestantism in Britain. 
the Tractarian Society. I recommend that you all do your own little research on the Tractarian movement. And he says, uh, these little tracts which were showered like snowflakes over the country, they were, to borrow a figure from the military art, the gunboats of the papal invasion. All right, he's likening these gospel, uh, these uh, these uh, Christian tracts as gunboats of the papal invasion. This is the prime me- mechanism by which the Vatican, through the Jesuits, through the Protestant universities, Jesuitized Protestant England. And he says, while the volume was lying un- unbought in the book shelf, uh, the bookseller's shelf or unopened on the drawing room table, these tracts, written with great apparent unction and much logical acumen, were passing rapidly from hand to hand. They could be thrown into a railway carriage, circulated in the Baron's Hall. In short, they penetrated society where large volumes could not enter, and deposited seed destined to bear the early and plenteous harvest harvest. So Rome had a goal for these tracks, and they met their goal. Rome's in big trouble. These gospel tracts, or these Christian, or let's put these papal tracts were very accessible, very easy to read. They were short reads, and people who would not sit down and read a a Protestant volume, as we're doing here on First Amendment Radio on Inquisition Update, would much rather get their information from these little tracts, okay? All in the name of expedience and 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 uh, convenience, instead of hard work. That's how England was conquered for the Pope through these little tracts. And he says, a short period indeed divided that seed time from its harvest. In other words, they went to work on England, and it wasn't long. There was a bounteous harvest in England for Rome. He says, and accordingly, the next stage of this development was the appearance of Puseyism in the Church of England. All right Now we're talking about the Church of England, the Protestant Church, as uh, uh, it existed under Henry VIII, and under uh, Edward the Sixth and Elizabeth the First, the Church of England was Protestant. But now, there's beginning to be an uprising within the Church of England, and the uprising is called Puseyism. And you can look that up for yourself. But in a nutshell, Puseyism <coughs> restored this cockamamie idea this Roman Catholic idea, this papal idea, this satanic idea that the communion bread is become as blessed by the priest, the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ. They call it the real presence of the, of the, of the Eucharist. Now, stop and think. The Queen of England when she swore her oath of a, of, of a coronation, had to swear that she denies transubstantiation. The very Queen of England, the Protestant Queen of England, in order to qualify to sit upon that throne, has to assure by an oath all of England that she will uphold the Protestant faith without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that she condemns transubstantiation as a lie, that somehow the priest, or in this case a, 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 a pastor in the Protestant church, does not have the power to yank Christ off of his throne and put him in that piece of bread that is served on the table of the Eucharist, of, of the uh, the Roman Catholic Mass. They're trying to return the Church of England to the basic communion of Roman Catholicism, a sacrifice, as if 
Christ's blood on the cross of Calvary had no effect and that it must be rehearsed and that it must be eaten by the people in order for them to receive Jesus into themselves. And that by consuming his blood and by consuming his body literally, not figuratively, but literally in the communion service, grace is infused not imputed, as we believe in Protestantism, but infused. This is Puseyism, and it began to be a hot topic of debate and contention within the Protestant Church of England. So now they're really making inroads into the Protestant Church in England. Now remember, this started with just six Protestant youths going to Rome to be educated by the Jesuits. It found itself first in Ireland through universities and colleges instructing Roman Catholic children into the Jesuit plan for the conquering of both Ireland and England and Scotland. Now it moves to the mainland in England. They overthrow the Protestant law and, leave, and, and make it legal for Catholics to participate in Parliament and serve in Parliament. Then they infiltrate the, the universities of the Roman Catholic laity and, Catho- and Catholicize and Jesuitize them. Then they seek to infiltrate the Protestants, the, the Protestant colleges, and now they're infiltrating the Protestant church. You see how the cancer spreads? That's how, it, that's how it's happened here in the United States. Almost a mirror image of what happened in, in England at this time. To what effect? In England, they began to teach Puseyism. That the communion bread is not just a memorial. It's a literal sacrifice whereby grace is infused. In the United States, they taught futurism. They promoted futurism. That the papacy is not the Antichrist. No pope is the Antichrist. But the Antichrist isn't historical, as all the Protestant reformers said. The Antichrist is a single individual. And he doesn't come until just before Christ's return, either seven years or three and a half years before Christ's return. So, by that alone, the Jesuits have conquered Protestant America, just like they attempted to conquer Protestant England. He says, a short period indeed divided that seed time that seed time that was started by the Tractarian movement from its harvest, the Catholicization of Britain. And accordingly, the next stage of this development was the appearance of Puseyism in the Church of England. Okay? Adherents of the Church of England, Protestants, began to embrace Puseyism. Now, he says, several busy years had been passing in sowing Roman seed. Within the universities, it had been largely scattered. Outside the universities, it had been scattered still more largely. And now the fields began to be white unto harvest. The pulpit was now heard to speak with Roman voice. And by and by, ministers of the Church of England began to go over very scantily at first, to the Church of Rome. The process by which their perversion was accomplished was a skillful and subtle one, just like Satan himself. Now he says they were made to feel as if in becoming first Tractarian and next Romanist, they had adopted no new creed at all, but had only fulfilled or followed boldly and logically to its natural issues a creed they had always held. Okay, somehow they 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 were so, so successful in this transformation of people that they weren't even aware of how they'd been perverted. Sound familiar? 
And he says, and now the number of successions to Rome among the clergy amounted to more than 200, and to a number still larger among the nobility, the gentry, and the middle classes. Okay, not only is it causing some Protestant ministers to go back over to Roman Catholicism, but those who serve the civil government, the nobility, the gentry, and the middle classes. Romanism is having a heyday in Protestant Great Britain. And you must know how that affects James A. Wiley and how it should affect us when we've seen the same insidious cancer growing in this land almost since the founding of it. Now he says the next step in advance was the abolition of the statute forbidding the introduction into the country of bulls and rescripts from the Pope. It had been a long-held law in England. The Pope could not issue anything from his so-called throne in Rome. No bulls, no encyclicals, no instructions to the laity, no instructions to the priest. The Pope was out. He was not allowed to communicate in England. All right? That used to be the law in the country in the United States. But now our government invites the Pope not to just come to this country but to address our legislature. Is all of this starting to have some significance? The mainstream media passed it off as, well, certainly not even a glimpse of what it really was. What authority the papacy has over our legislative body was completely skipped over. And yet, if you look at the words and the gestures of that pope, and you understand the most recent papal encyclicals and bulls that have been passed throughout this country, you can come to no other conclusion, especially after reading the previous book that we concluded with here on Inquisition Update called The Global Vatican. You can only conclude that the papacy now has free hand in our government. It's becoming a papal country. A papal country. And if, if, if there's any way possible, I have to convey to my listeners and friends what consequence all of this has for Bible-believing Christians, Protestants. He said they were made to feel as if in becoming first Tractarian and next Romanist, they had adopted no creed but had only, they had adopted no new creed but had only followed boldly and logically to its natural issues, a creed they had always held. And now the number of successions to Rome among the clergy amounts to more than 200 and to a number still larger among the nobility, the gentry, and the middle classes. The next step in advance was the abolition of the statute forbidding the introduction into the country of bulls and rescripts from the Pope. The penal statutes against popery were abolished in 1778. They were framed by our, fa our fathers not to oppress papists, but to protect their own liberties against popish machinations. Okay, he's talking about a body of laws that were passed in Great Britain after the overthrow of the papacy that protected all Britons from popish tyranny. It protected Protestants and Catholics from popish tyranny. He says they, these, these laws were framed by our fathers not to oppress papists, but to protect their own liberties against popish machinations. They were extremely mild when we consider that when they were framed, the gibbets on which the Protestants <coughs> had been hanged were but newly taken down. 
and the ashes of the fires in which they had been burned were yet scarce cold. Mild, especially when we compare them with the statute of decumberendo heretico, framed in the time of Henry the Fourth, and always acted upon so long as the government was in the hands of papists. What was that? Bitter. Roman persecution against Protestants, the burning of Protestants as heretics. That's what the penal laws protected all of Great Britain from. Popish persecution. Wonder what will happen in this country when Rome gains the upper hand and a Protestants begin to resist. Sorry to end so late in the program, but my voice is concluding. So we'll continue tomorrow if I can regain some, some, uh, some of my voice. Thank you.